spot at other gyms. No, if they know to ask for a blind spot, they've done it before. They have to be punished. For the second time since May, a Fairfax County Sheriff's deputy was fired for allegedly assaulting a person in custody. The most recent incident happened earlier this month. Sergeant Joshua Silver was, assault, was charged with assault after he was seen on camera allegedly punching a handcuffed man repeatedly inside a marked cruiser. At the city's police department violated the civil rights of its residents through excessive force and intimidation. Violating the first, fourth, and fourteenth amendments, investigators found outstanding warrants for more than half the town's residents because of fines they haven't and in many cases couldn't pay. The Department of Justice investigation determining that police used excessive force, unlawfully stopped, searched, and arrested residents and did so almost exclusively toward black residents. And she's the one who has reported that he, in trying to put on his shorts to go to the hospital, fell over and bumped into either a police officer or uh, one of the first responders and that seemed to trigger a change in their behavior to treating him like a criminal at that point instead of a patient. The court documents reveal disturbing details about what happened to the children involved. Jeffrey Frisbee, who's also the assistant police chief in Prague, facing two dozen criminal charges. Anything you'd like to say at all regarding this case? Jeffrey and Kimberly Frisbee leaving the Lincoln County Courthouse Thursday. Jeffrey Frisbee, the assistant police chief in Prague, is being charged with 22 lewd acts with a child and two counts of rape. His wife, Kimberly, charged with 17 counts of child abuse. Good morning. Welcome to the Bad Apple Report. It's 7.30 a.m. bright and early right here at Home on the Range. Thank you so much for being here today, folks. I really appreciate it. We've got a lot of bad apples to get to. And you know what? Since we've got what appears to be a whole town going down, I am going to interject a lot less today so that you'll stick around, all right? And we'll see you at the end of the show. This week, a jury will decide whether former Charleston County deputy is guilty of homicide in a crash that killed one man in West Ashley in 2020. Dash cam video of the damp early morning in May shows Barry traveling down Old Town Road when Jenkins SUV makes a left turn and Barry's cruiser hits the SUV head on. Barry was on patrol and made the 911 call himself, saying a car pulled out in front of him. The prosecution argues that Barry was driving so far above the speed limit that he caused the crash and ultimately cost Jenkins his life. Dash cam GPS data shows Barry traveling upwards of 80 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone in the 30 seconds before the collision. In their opening arguments, the defense called what happened that day an accident. They pointed out multiple times in the first day of testimony that the victim was not wearing a seatbelt and they questioned experts to say a seatbelt could have prevented fatal injuries. They say while Barry shouldn't have been speeding, the victim shouldn't have turned left when there was a car coming and the turn is what actually caused the crash. Jenkins family sued Barry for wrongful death in civil court and reached an agreement in that case where the insurance companies paid out the family $750,000. The first day of testimony was a packed courtroom with friends and family of both Barry and Jenkins waiting to see what a jury will make of the 2020 crash. According to court documents, three children were placed in the care of the Frisbees as foster children. After conducting several interviews with the children, they all told investigators that Jeffrey had inappropriately touched them. Additionally, a former foster child of the Frisbees was also interviewed and told police that Jeffrey had raped her while she lived in their home. The foster children also told investigators that Kimberly Frisbee would punish the children by making them stand facing a wall for long periods, hitting them and pulling their hair. The Department of Human Services telling News 4 in a statement saying in part, the children who were placed in this home have been removed and are receiving appropriate services to support them in this difficult time. Documents also reveal that Kimberly Frisbee allegedly kicked and strangled foster children in the past. The district attorney says he plans to make sure justice is served, saying in a statement, at this time, our investigation is still ongoing as we determine who, if any, knew or should have known about the alleged abuse of the foster children in their care. In this video, 
released by the Fairfax County Sheriff's Office, you can hear Nicholas Marcos before you see him. The 32-year-old has been arrested for assaulting a Fairfax County police officer. And as you can see in the video, he is not cooperating with the police or the sheriff's deputies trying to get him into the marked cruiser. By the time they get to the jail, the video shows Marcos refusing to do what the deputies are asking him to do. Get the f away from me. Quit shining that light on me, boy. That's how it's gonna be. F you. You're gonna cooperate or you're gonna get dragged out? The video then appears to show Sergeant Joshua Silver punching Marcos three times in the face before being pulled out of the car. The video then comes to an end. Silver is set to make his first court appearance November 6th. Nicholas Marcos has been released on bail. Now, back on May 8th, police charged former Deputy Sheriff Nicholas Vassell with assaulting an inmate in the jail last January. He was fired from the sheriff's office, but court records now show the Commonwealth's attorney dropped the charges against him. No, it's not enough to have just one backseat beater. No, we have an update on the famous backseat beater from a month or so ago. According to the lawsuit, Billy Corm was caught by JPD officer Joseph Harris after attempting to escape from a hospital. Corm had been taken to the hospital after telling jail staff he'd ingested fentanyl. While Harris was taking Corm to the county jail, he began to strangle himself with a seatbelt. Harris then stopped the patrol car and could be seen in video shared by the police department beating Corm into submission before finally slamming the door on his head. What's going on? Then, after taking Coram to the county jail, Harris was caught on body camera footage, apparently hitting him again, drawing protests from other officers. We're going to show this department and this city and state that Joseph Harris was not one bad apple. Joseph Harris was a symbol, was a symbol of, of the climate of this environment. He was among several very bad apples, all coexisting and all protected by Chief Elliott and the city of Jonesboro. Attorneys suing on Coram's behalf say that his beating was just one example of a pattern of excessive use of force at the Jonesboro Police Department. The lawsuit cites several other examples of Harris's use of excessive force. There are multiple documented uses of excessive force, one for which he was administratively suspended. Um, but because this was a preventable incident, Joseph Harris was a ticking time bomb that the city of Jonesboro unleashed on its citizens. According to Kaiser, Coram is still dealing with physical injuries caused by Harris, including impaired vision. I just want people hearing about this story to remember there is a, a human being at the end of it, and it's not former Officer Harris, it's, it's Billy Coram, and he's going to have to deal with this no matter what happens in this courthouse for the rest of his life. The only thing I really have right now is anger. Anger fueling the drive for justice for 26-year-old dad of two, Riker Earl. He died earlier this month after his family says Jasper County, Indiana emergency medical technicians sedated him, and police then held him face down for more than 15 minutes during a medical emergency. Earl, his family says, was prone to having seizures. EMTs responded to help him the day of September 8th, and his family says some of the same EMTs returned that evening along with police because a more severe seizure at his home in DeMott, Indiana, prompted his grandmother to call 911. And she's the one who has reported that he, in trying to put on his shorts to go to the hospital, fell over and bumped into either a police officer or uh, one of the first responders, and that seemed to trigger a change in their behavior to treating him like a criminal at that point instead of a patient. The family says officers took Earl to the floor, handcuffed him behind his back with his face in a pillow. There was an officer on the upper part of the backside of his body. I had witnessed him begging for his life. Earl's aunt says she was in the room as his body went limp. I was just begging and pleading. He's blue. He's blue, like he's blue, you can tell he's blue. Do something, take his pulse. She says when first responders did take his pulse, there wasn't one. Earl was taken to the hospital, but tests confirmed he had no brain activity. He was removed from life support on September 10th.
The sheriff's office statement from two days later makes no mention of the circumstances of Earl's death. It reads that officers responded to a medical 911 call from a residence, and on September 10th, the office was informed the patient had passed away. The family has hired national civil rights attorney Ben Crump and Indiana attorney Stephen Wagner to investigate what happened, and they're zeroing in on the actions of officers and EMTs, actions they say put Earl at greater risk. Yeah, the dangers of prone restraint have been known for years to law enforcement. Everybody in the public has known about them since the George Floyd case in May of 2020. The coroner hasn't yet released Earl's cause of death, but the attorneys are requesting his medical records and the body camera video of the incident to get answers for his family. It was a 26-year-old man with a whole lot of life ahead of him. She was only made aware of what happened to her son when another inmate who witnessed the incident called to let her know he needed medical attention. They're going to be punished for this. The inmate told her her son was beaten by officers for having a cell phone. He laid down and said, I surrender. And they told him, you don't love your life. And they put him in handcuffs and they beat him. They beat him. Adelina says she was told multiple officers were involved. And they asked the captain and the lieutenant for a black spot. They was looking for a spot where nobody could see them, where they can beat them or kill them away from the camera. On Monday, I asked DOC about the incident and was told Verdon had a contraband cell phone, ran from officers, smashed the phone, then lay down on the ground to be cuffed. The spokesperson specifically said there was no use of force, and although Verdon complained of some pain and discomfort, he was checked out by two different hospital staffs and cleared. After receiving several tips that the corrections officers involved in the incident had been suspended, I followed up with that question. DOC responded saying no officer slash employees were placed on administrative leave due to this incident as no such action was warranted. The paperwork confirms his pain is the result of an assault, which paramedics who brought him in called an excessive use of force. However, besides the pain, it does not document any official injuries. If he had no injuries, then why? Why did he not walk in his own two legs? On Thursday, DOC announced Warden Donnie Bordelon and an unnamed corrections officer had been suspended due to a, quote, inappropriate use of force incident, which directly contradicted how the spokesperson for DOC had classified the incident in previous emails. Following that release, DOC and their attorney called to say the information they gave us at first was accurate with the knowledge they had at the time. But since then, more information surfaced, which led to the disciplinary action and new investigation. They're not going to care. They're going to feel like, oh, we're going to get away with it. Because Adlina says more than one officer beat her son, she believes more people need to be removed from their position. Officers also retaliated against those criticizing the police department, too, and used the fines and fees from these discriminatory arrests to fund the department. Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark says residents owe the police department $1.7 million in outstanding fines and keeps people behind bars when they cannot pay. The police must enforce the law even-handedly, not based on generating revenue. Lexington, though, focused its law enforcement on strategies that generated income even at times linking police officers' paychecks to the number of arrests they made. Over the past two years, Lexington has made nearly one arrest for every four people in town, more than 10 times the per capita arrest rate for Mississippi. Now, federal officials say Lexington's police department and city have agreed to cooperate and address these challenges, but it's not clear what that will look like at this point. We are here today to announce the findings from our pattern or practice investigation into the city of Lexington, Mississippi, and the Lexington Police Department. We find reasonable cause to believe that the Lexington Police Department and the city of Lexington engage in a pattern or practice of conduct that violates the first, fourth, and 14th amendments of the Constitution, the Safe Streets Act, and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Specifically, we find that the Lexington police use excessive force, unlawfully stop 
search and arrest people, including by jailing people on illegal, quote, investigative holds, end quote, unlawfully jail people without affording prompt access to court, violate the rights of people engaged in free speech and expression, including by retaliating against critics of the police and unlawfully discriminate against Black people. The department also unlawfully arrests, jails, and detains people based on their failure to pay money without assessing their ability to pay. Unlawfully arrests people just because they owe outstanding fines and imposes money bail without justification and again without assessing ability to pay. The fact that fines and fees fund the department drives its law enforcement resulting in a crude policing for profit scheme. The Lexington Police Department operates under an unconstitutional financial conflict of interest. Lexington's focus on revenue and its overly aggressive form of policing leaves the people of Lexington feeling harassed, helpless, and hopeless. For example, on the day that we opened our investigation, Lexington officers chased a man down and tased him until he foamed at the mouth. In the previous months, police officers had repeatedly arrested the man for minor offenses that most police departments would have handled with a ticket. For stealing sugar packets from a gas station, the man spent 13 days in jail. He spent four days in jail for taking a second cup of coffee after paying for the first. Each time, the Lexington police kept him in jail because he could not afford to pay the fines or the $50 processing fee Lexington charges for every arrest. Especially for a person in poverty, these fines are no small thing. Even though he has no money, the man owes the Lexington Police Department over $7,500. At no point did the police or city assess his ability to pay those fines. In America, being poor is not a crime, but in Lexington, their practices punish people for poverty. We cannot stand for the criminalization of poverty in this country. On February 29th, we provided official notice to Lexington city officials and the police department about our concerns regarding illegal arrests and detentions that penalize people for lacking resources. Lexington has made modest changes, but as today's findings show, more meaningful reform is necessary. Lexington's fines and fees have been absolutely devastating for the people who live there. Although Lexington is one of the poorest counties in America, people owe the police department $1.7 million in outstanding fines. The Lexington Municipal Court has issued bench warrants for over 650 people based on unpaid fines, equivalent to roughly half of Lexington's population. Based on these warrants, police officers have unlawfully arrested and jailed people using the leverage of incarceration to extract more money from them. Other times, the Lexington police send people to jail for days or weeks for minor offenses. People are left to languish in jail until they can go before a judge or they can scrape enough money together to pay their fines. This, too, violates people's civil rights. For example, the Lexington police arrested a black man for allegedly taking $15 worth of gas. The police told him the fine was $300. He couldn't pay it. The police sent him to jail until the next scheduled court date two weeks later. Unjustly enforcing fines and fees creates a two-tiered system of justice that can perpetuate a cycle of poverty. It also fuels a financial conflict of interest for the police department. The police must enforce the law even-handedly, not based on generating revenue. Lexington, though, 
focused its law enforcement on strategies that generated income, even at times linking police officers' paychecks to the number of arrests they made. Over the past two years, Lexington has made nearly one arrest for every four people in town, more than 10 times the per capita arrest rate for Mississippi. The Lexington police also illegally arrest people for using profanity, and they retaliate against people who simply film officers or criticize the police. The First Amendment protects swearing, yet the Lexington police broke down a man's back door and arrested him for swearing in a public space. The First Amendment also protects the right to film or criticize officers. But when a man filmed officers approaching his suicidal brother with their guns raised, a police officer batted the man's phone out of his hand, pushed him to the ground, and arrested him. While making arrests, the Lexington police frequently use excessive force. We found instances in which officers used a taser like a cattle prod to punish people or to make them comply more quickly with officers' orders. For example, officers used a taser to shock a Black man 18 times until he was covered in his own vomit and unable to speak or talk. Officers punch, hit, or kick people who are unarmed and handcuffed. One officer kicked a black man in the groin so hard that he wet himself. Another used his gun to repeatedly hit a black man already in handcuffs. Another officer knocked an elderly black man unconscious. Nor are children spared from attack. An officer grabbed a black child by the neck and shoved him into a patrol car, banging the child's head against the door frame. Black people bear the brunt of the Lexington Police Department's illegal conduct. Lexington's former police chief, Sam Dobbins, who regularly spoke disrespectfully to Black men, set in motion the aggressive enforcement of low-level violations. Dobbins left the department when recordings of him using racial slurs were released. Officials told us that with Dobbins gone, so too was the problem. We found, however, that the discriminatory practices he initiated continue unabated. We found, however, uh, we also found that Lexington officers frequently tase, punch, and beat Black people without justification, while we identified no such use of force on white people. Low-level traffic violations that resulted in arrest for Black people yielded only warnings or citations for white people. The result, 98% of people arrested for traffic offenses are Black. This pattern of racial discrimination not only violates the law, it also erodes the community's trust in law enforcement, the judicial system, and the government more broadly. According to the Bureau of Justice uh, Statistics, half of America's police departments have 10 officers or fewer. Every person in the United States enjoys certain fundamental rights, regardless of the size of their town, the contents of their bank account, or the color of their skin. Residents of rural and underserved communities have the same rights and deserve the same protections as people who live in major cities. The Justice Department is committed to providing that protection. Police misconduct in smaller communities may not always garner national attention, but rest assured the Justice Department is watching. No city, no town, no law enforcement agency is too large or too small to evade our efforts to safeguard the constitutional rights that every American enjoys. Small and mid-sized police departments must not be allowed to violate people's civil rights with impunity. Lexington is a small rural community, but its police department has had a heavy hand in people's lives wreaking havoc through use of excessive force, discriminatory policing, retaliation, and more. For too long, the department has been playing by its own rules 
and operating with impunity. It's time for this to end. To the people of Lexington, I want you to know that we heard you, we listened to your testimonies, and we thank you for having the courage to speak up. The Lexington Police Department and the city of Lexington have agreed to cooperate with the Justice Department to address the serious challenges we outlined today as we begin the hard, essential work of rebuilding trust and restoring equal justice under law, we need to continue to hear from the Lexington community in the coming days and weeks. We stand with the people of Lexington to extend justice to all its residents, rich and poor, regardless of their race. Wow. A lot of bad apples today. Okay. Thank you so much for sticking around to watch the Bad Apple Report this morning, just like every morning right here at Home on the Range. And as usual, I'm going to go whip up another batch of bad apples just for you. And we'll see you right back here tomorrow morning at 7.30 a.m. bright and early. Have a great day, folks. <laughs>